Okay, everybody. Uh, thank you for signing on. We're excited to do this with uh, with Beat the GMAT. So, my name is Kofi Cancam. I am one of the co-founders of Admit Advantage. I see a lot of you every day on the Beat the GMAT um, MBA watch forums. Today, we're going to speak about something near and dear to me: uh, non-traditional applicants. And it's important to me because I also applied to business school uh, way back when as a non-traditional applicant. I worked in consulting, done a little technology stuff, but I was a a science major in college, had never taken an economics or accounting or finance class, and I had a lot of concerns about how I stacked up and how to present myself to, you know, to sort of the admissions committee members when I thought I would be competing against other people who had much more relevant business and accounting and finance type experience. So this webinar um, is for those people that are have an atypical background and consider themselves non-traditional, and, um, and it's something obviously I understand personally. So I'm going to give you a little bit of information on the company, just so you feel comfortable that I know what I'm talking about to a certain extent. Um, then we'll speak about sort of, you know, what what the common uh, perceptions are, some misperceptions of what sort of non-traditional applicants are. Uh, we'll look at a couple of case studies of people that we've worked with, and then uh, we'll take some options and next steps. We'll talk about that if you're interested in working with us, uh, which is not obviously not mandatory. And then I'm going to take uh, questions. We're going to finished near the top of the hour, so we're going to try to move quickly. You will notice that all of you are on mute. It's not because I don't want to hear your wonderful voices. It's really because um, there's a lot of feedback um, sometimes if we turn it on. If you have very pressing questions, I cannot wait. Feel free to type them, but generally we're going to try to take them on the back end, and it will leave plenty of time to, to get to your queries. So we essentially help people get into school at the end of the day. So. We work with people that are applying to all different kinds of schools, you know, uh, college to law school to medical school. But obviously, uh, for the purpose of this presentation, really overall our bread and butter is business school. Uh, we work with candidates from inception, them saying basically, you know, I want to go to school. I've got no idea where I want to apply, how to put myself together, if you know, if I'm even sort of uh, competitive to candidates getting in and having to make decisions about which school to attend and candidates getting in and having money at one school but not money at the school they love and trying to sort of figure that out and get the their dream school to give them money. So it's really sort of soup to nuts when we take people wherever they are in the process. We are known to be very structured um, and we're quite deliberate about that. Eric and I, the founders, were science guys. Um, we really believe in process, especially when you're either a candidate that's applying to school from a very um, common feeder background where you've got to compete with other people that are also applying to school, people that you work with, you know, people that went to the same kind of school or college you went to, to the other end of the spectrum, which are people that work in industries that are not typically sending people to business school or come from schools that don't typically send people to business school. It's really important in that sense to show that you're qualified, you're competent, and you know what you're getting into. Okay? We've been very fortunate in the last couple of years to have really good people. We've been able to benefit from sort of the, the economic downturn to find really exceptional um, consultants who aren't just from great schools with great sort of grades, but also are really good people um, and have great bedside manner and are quite diverse in terms of their industry. So we've tried to bring people on our team that mirror the industries that all of you are coming from and or seeking. So we have a ton of people in finance and marketing and we had a, uh, a speechwriter for Joe Biden. We've got another government person uh, for the EPA. We've got technologists, consultants, entrepreneurs, real estate people. It kind of runs the gamut in the 40 plus people we have. All of our people are sort of underscored or by by or sort of helmed by three real tenants. One, experience. We want people. We have people that have been on both sides of the table. So all of us in the last you know 10 plus years have been in your position. Have been sort of heading into the fall knowing that we wanted to go to school the next year, not knowing what our future really held. We've also been on the other side of the table to helping to evaluate candidates, either through secondary interviews, alumni interviews, and or working directly with admissions. Um, we're known to be very client focused. Uh, we love that. It kind of makes the job more fun. And it allows us to sort of really deep dive with our candidates and, and get to know them better and hopefully get them to reveal sort of things about them around which we can build their application. And then performance. So we really demand that uh, people get into great schools with manner of themselves. We demand that of them. And we've been very fortunate historically to have people at these schools. And I think actually we have 
literally people on campus of every one of these schools right now and, and some others as well. Okay? I'm Kofi, I'm sort of the dumber founder, but they always tell you work with smarter people. Uh, so the two of us founded the company, Eric and I, very similar backgrounds, both worked at Accenture in different cities. We both sold software companies, I sold mine. Actually after business school, Eric sold his right before business school. Um, we met at Wharton with class of 04. Uh, my undergraduate degree is in neurobiology from Harvard. I stayed there and pursued a master's in education. At Wharton, sort of the three big things I did was, you know, well, I had sort of in my, uh, in my background, I suppose, you know, I was a Joseph Wharton fellow, very lucky to get that. It was about $50,000, which was a lot at that time. I ran Wharton's largest uh, student-run campus, and I also was a teaching fellow for a first-year core marketing class. Eric did very well at Wharton, uh, graduated with honors, was a Twigo fellow, which at the time was a full ride, and he did his undergraduate degree at Brown, and he's been involved um, as a Brown alumni interviewer, and I've been involved as a Harvard alumni interviewer. So we, we've been sort of in the positions. We have great people. You can check them out on the website, okay? Let's get to it. So it's interesting. When we talk to candidates every day, they come up with uh, different ideas of what they think is an entrepreneur. Well, you know, I mostly agree with some of the stuff they're talking about. Although, in this day and age, you know, non-traditional, it's hard to find people in that bucket because business schools are sort of the catch-all. They're really looking for so many different kinds of people that what, t you know, 15, 20 years ago was non-traditional has probably really changed today. But typically, in terms of the examples that you see of non-traditionals, you've got, you know, people that are lawyers, you've got artists, you know, I was just on a panel actually in Boston two days ago with a guy who applied to business school from working in the music industry. He basically he was like a mini Kanye West, uh, which is pretty interesting. Um, doctors, you see this more and more, and you see programs that are creating MD, MBA programs. Um, researchers, right, these are people that sort of maybe either have a PhD or maybe even don't, but they're working in, in labs sort of around the world. Um, these older candidates, so I'd say candidates above the age of 35, I think that's, you know, let's say 33, I think it's somewhat not traditional. You've also got, you know, younger candidates as well, right, who are sort of applying straight from college. Military, sort of that falls in the bucket as well, okay. Teachers, you are seeing more and more educators coming in. Um, sometimes they're going into fields uh, doing education management. They're going to organizations like the Broad. Uh, residency, but you see more educators coming in as well. Okay, that's kind of what I would consider to be a large port part of the universe of non-traditionals. Although, as I mentioned, it's increasingly becoming uh, it's becoming increasingly harder to categorize the people as non-traditionals because you you know these schools are really trying to recruit people from all different walks of life. So, if you go to, for example, to most top-tier business schools, you will find military clubs. Right, there are that many military people that they've got organized clubs, and those are often some of the most powerful clubs on campus. So keep that in mind, and I say this just to make you feel comfortable that you're not going to be on the outside looking in if you're coming from one of these, one of these places. So business schools do want more non-traditional candidates, okay? So, you know, it's actually quite positive. I think if you can show you're competent and show that you've got a, a very good motivation uh, and reason to go to business school, I actually think it's better to be applying to business school from a, an atypical background than from your typical staple companies, right? Um, it's kind of the norm, as mentioned. Uh, you need to make sure personally, I mean, there, there are two aspects. There's the aspect of sort of impressing the admissions committee members, and then there's the aspect of making sure really business school is the right choice for you. And you need to make sure it's, it, it's smart and it's intelligent and it fits your goals. Um, it is a huge commitment and it does change, uh, you know, your trajectory. I am speaking to a good friend of mine, another guy who works in the EPA, uh, went to MIT, and he's trying to make sh see if it makes sense for him to get an MBA. And he's really, he's really intent on getting it because a lot of his good friends have MBAs, but it's not clear to me based on his goals, uh, wanting to stay sort of in sort of the government structure, um, you know, wanting to stay sort of in clean energy, but not from sort of the corporate side. It's not clear that he needs an MBA or it makes sense that kind of financial and time commitment. So just. Make sure, you know, it, it does make sense for you. Make sure you're having conversations um, to, to sort of convince yourself, okay? Remember, you do bring a lot to the table, and you need to think about how you will make a contribution. 
not just from an academic perspective, but also from a professional and extracurricular perspective. Okay? Um, we meet so many nutritionists who are just not confident that they have anything to offer, but if you look at sort of the cases that are done in these business schools, they touch all different kinds of industries. And often people have got deep industry expertise or experience in an atypical industry. That's actually really valuable to the discussions. And so you've got to make sure you're highlighting that. You've got to paint a picture of kind of what your short and long-term goals are and make sure you're doing research, right? Make sure you're clear about what you're going to get from school, how much it's going to cost you. You know, if you want to go into an atypical, if you're coming from an atypical field and you want to return to that atypical field, make sure you're clear about your school's prospects of placing people in that field and how much money you'll make. You know, are you, are you going to business school, you're going to spend all this money to come out and enter a job, you're going to make $70,000 a year. Right? That may not make sense for you financially. So make sure you're on top of that. There's so many resources out there in a way that didn't exist even five to seven years ago. So just you know, do your research. Okay? Not traditionals inherently don't really have a formal business education, right? And the positives of that are that look, going to business school, a lot of people are are career changers. I mean, most people going to business school are career changers because they wouldn't incur that cost in terms of the expense of it as well as the lost income. They wouldn't incur that kind of cost if they didn't need to do it. Okay? Um, most business school students, uh, this is kind of a surprise for a lot of people, didn't major in business or accounting or finance or economics. If you look at the top tier schools, call the top 20-ish schools, you typically find 60 plus percent of the people majored in sort of the life sciences or the humanities. Okay, history, English, social studies, etc. So you're actually not in the norm um, uh, if you majored in business, accounting, finance, or statistics. You probably will be a little bit more advanced, um, but you shouldn't feel uncomfortable if you're not coming from one of those areas. And realize admissions committee members or adcoms they want a class with diverse experiences. So you know they, the professors want that. The professors demand that when they're teaching a class. They want people in that class who can help shape the discussion. The schools want people in learning teams, uh, which are sort of your small, usually pre-assigned groups uh, that you go through your first year with, that you do a lot of the group work together on. You know, they usually want those people, they want those teams to be quite diverse, internationally, racially, certainly professionally. It's probably the most important. So uh, they don't want a bunch of people from Golden or a bunch of people from McKinsey. That, that can't be an entire class, right? On the negative side, though, um, as a non-traditional, you typically don't understand the business world, right? And now, granted, that's why you go to business school, but sometimes that makes it hard for you to articulate what you want to do after school, and or the schools are really paying attention and thinking, yeah, this, this person isn't really aware of kind of all the opportunities. This person necessarily isn't going to be, they may not find accounting, for example, really easy. They may struggle with that. So you've got to be sensitive to that and realize that your grades and your GMAT scores are quite important in that instance, right? Um, and it sort of that ties into the second and third points, right? It's hard for you to sort of say why you want to get an MBA. I think it, and it's, it, sometimes it lacks credibility um, in a way that someone who works, say, as an accountant or worked in finance or in marketing, they sometimes have a better idea of, of, of exactly what they want to do. They know people doing that job. They've got a taste of that specific job in a way that someone coming from a very, very different field um, may not know. And obviously, as I mentioned, there are concerns about you know, your ability to sort of keep up and do the work. Okay? So if you don't, you know, some sort of advantages, you know, if you don't have sort of the requisite background supplemented. So for example, if you, if you have a really good GMAT score and a good GPA, you may not need this. But even if you do, you may consider taking classes in accounting, finance, economics, or stats. If you're coming from a typical background to supplement your sort of academic, the lack of academic sort of focus, be reading the journal, be reading the Financial Times, okay? Go to conferences, especially those offered on campus. Make sure you're getting more and more experience in the vernacular of business school, the, the culture of business school, the culture of business as a whole. Show the schools that you're basically taking those steps with or without them, that you're going to come to school you know, not necessarily totally wet behind the ears, but with some momentum and some sort of self-taught background. That's really important. And no matter what your field is that you're doing before business school, try to find areas that exhibit business skills and leadership, right? So 
get involved in activities um, that showcase your ability to sort of you know take initiative to run organizations to manage budgets look for those opportunities and professionally make sure that you're focusing on things that you're bringing to the table that that are relevant for business even if they're not direct business schools so for example skills so if you're, for example if you're a teacher right you're managing a group of 15 to 30 people right you are you are uh, have to be a master communicator right time management is quite important if you're in the military the ability to sort of deal with pressure the ability to work in a chain of command the ability to deal with imperfect information and make decisions those kinds of things are all relevant business skills quote unquote and leadership opportunities that are relevant for business school and now if you want to be successful in applying, it's up to you to highlight those things that you bring to the table. Every job, every industry um, brings, offers you the opportunity to basically highlight something that's relevant for business or for business school. And just make sure you're thinking widely and thinking creatively about that. Okay, Get out of the box. Typically, you have alternative work experience, right? And so that, that's one of the things about being sort of a nutritional candidate. You're not doing your, your two to five years at, a, at a, you know, a big, well-known firm and then applying to school. There are positives and negatives to that. The positives are, you know, the trends are in your favor, as I mentioned. The GRE, I think the fact that, now we still consider the GMAT the standard, but I think the fact that the GRE is increasingly being accepted is a really good indicator that business schools are reaching out to people outside of sort of a, a typical business field, okay? You're inherently differentiated. I can't tell you how many times I speak to candidates um, that are applying to school and they're coming from typical industries and they're so concerned about being differentiated. You're automatically differentiated, which is really great. You bring unique perspective to the classroom. And, and here's a point people don't really think about. You know, business schools do consider, when, when you're in a world where 70% of the people applying are qualified, and yet as a school you're going to accept 12 to 20, 25%. You definitely do factor in, do people really need a degree? Do they need that MBA, right? If you've went to, let's say, University of Virginia undergrad, and you're working in American Express, and you want to continue working in that field, versus someone who you know, went to another good school, say Ohio State, and works in, in, in research at, say, the National Institute of Health, and they want to become a healthcare investor, they're not going to be, that latter person is not going to be able to make that transition unless they get an MBA. The first person, the person that went to Duke, or they went to UVA and works at Amex, you know, they don't necessarily need an MBA. And schools do think about that, um, whether or not it's, it's absolutely imperative for you to get an MBA. That is a factor. I won't say that's the most important factor, but it is a factor, and it's something that if you're atypical and non-traditional, you should use uh, to your advantage, okay? The negatives are that um, it's hard sometimes, let's use that example I just talked about, it's hard sometimes for that person who say, works in NIH, now it's of Health, it would be hard for that person to sometimes articulate how he or she gets to Silicon Valley to become a huge healthcare tech investor. It's not really that clear sometimes to them, and it's hard to articulate um, in uh, you know a very limited sort of um, set of words, either through your letters of recommendation, your essays, the resume, the non-essay data portion. That's hard to sort of express how you get there. Okay, sometimes candidates struggle to project their specific skills that they have that are relevant for being a business leader. And you know, I mentioned in the last slide, you know, being in the military, being in education, there are things you have. Those are still soft skills, soft things. And sometimes candidates have a hard time really deep diving and showing specific experiences which are relevant for becoming this business leader that they desire, right? And sort of the articulation, it sort of ties in the third point, articulation of why you want it to be, why you want it now, the short long-term goals, that can be very tricky for people. Even people that potentially you know, work with us or we're coaching them through, they sometimes hit writer's block and they get uncomfortable. Um, most of the time I think it's discomfort because they're having to think about what they've done historically in a totally unique way, and sometimes they don't feel totally comfortable, you know, writing about specific skills or writing about their goals because they feel like they're not they're not worthy. Um, so you've got to sort of get over that. And then there's obviously the opportunity cost, right, in terms of uh, going to school. All candidates encounter this, um, but 
typically if you're uh, an atypical candidate, not traditional, you are walking away from, you might be walking away from an industry and that's hard for people to accept that they just spent three to four years doing something that's totally not relevant for their future. Okay. In terms of our advantages, focus on transferable skills. I mentioned that previously. Um, give me context for how you're doing in your world. Like the one thing that you'll find that schools want is high performance. High performance, high performance, high impact candidates in a matter of your industry. When you were coming from an atypical industry, teaching, um, film, uh, you know, military, et cetera, sometimes it's hard for schools to understand what high impact, high performance is. And that's where you really have to rely on your recommenders. You really need to coach them and instruct them. But if you're coming from those areas, you've got to find ways to contextualize your performance because a school may just have no idea, you know, what it means. So, so you're a, especially if you're like, you know, foreign. So let's say you're in the, if you're an American, let's say military person, it's easier. But if you're in the Indian military, if you're sort of in the Nigerian military and you're applying to business school, the schools may not understand sort of your ranking mechanism. So the fact that you may be some kind of, you know, sergeant, that may be a different position, a different relative ranking to a sergeant here. So you've got to make sure that you're explaining that kind of thing. Okay. Make sure you have a story down and you and you and you you do your research. And make sure I'm I'm wildly in favor of bold, audacious goals, okay? But I'm more in favor of planned out steps to get there. So we had a guy a couple years ago that um, basically worked in a nonprofit. He, um, he worked for KIPP, which is sort of a charter school network. And he indicated that he wanted to go to business school to start a hedge fund focused um, in Singapore and China. He'd been doing some reading and he thought he'd call, always been enchanted by by Asia and he felt like there was huge professional opportunity. And he was right, there was a huge opportunity. But he had no, he had no discernible skills or or um, leverage to get into the industry as quickly as he expected. So what he said basically was he was wanting to go to business school, and that he was going to start a hedge fund within like two three years after he graduated in in Asia. Right? He wasn't Asian, didn't speak you know any relevant languages, um, was a humanities major, and didn't work in finance at all. And so, you know, it was a great goal, but it just didn't fit the path wasn't correct. So if he'd sort of spoken more generally about, and which is what we coach him to do, more generally about, okay, look, I want to go to school, I'm going to focus on finance, I'm going to get a job, you know, either in consulting with the financial services industry or in finance itself, I might even sort of get there. I'm going to work in sort of an American office while I'm in school, by the way, I'm going to take Mandarin at the university. I'm going to then ask to get transferred with my office after three to four years to you know, to some place in Asia, and then basically have to work in there for three to five years, building my set of networks, building my, you know, my expertise and my training and my capital base, and then I'm going to look to start a company with some of my peers, right? That's much more realistic, and that's possible and doable, as opposed to saying, I'm going to start a company immediately when I graduate in this area. So you've got to have a story, but it's got to be realistic, and they want to see you've thought through the steps especially if you were an older candidate, okay? And then personally, make sure it's worth it to you. Really important, as I mentioned before, all right? So what are some non-traditional that, that, you know, we talk about this every day, people call us, right? People say, I'm too old to go to business school. We get this all the time. I say there's no such thing. That is not a real client <laughs> on the right-hand side. But, you know, we've had candidates that we've worked with that literally in the mid to late 50s. Um, some of them have successful, some of them haven't. Most of them have been successful, okay? But there's no such thing as being too old. You gotta find the right program. So, you know, if you're over 30, 35, a full time may not be right for you. Maybe you're going to an executive MBA. Maybe if you're working that much and you've got a mortgage and a family may, and you like your industry, maybe it makes sense to focus on going part time as opposed to full time. So, you know, or online or one year. There's so many different kinds of MBA programs that really at this point there really isn't an age at which you're too old to go you may not fit the classic bucket of a particular kind of program so if you are three to four years out of school on the other side and you want to do an executive MBA program you're probably not an executive right where they typically want eight to ten years of experience but there's so many different kinds of MBA programs that really being too old is kind of just a thing of the past really 
right? Um, if you are older than me and you indicate why it makes sense and why you want an MBA, the one thing that top tier schools are very reluctant to do is bring in people who are um, just looking to sort of resuscitate their careers, right? Everyone wants to bet on a winning horse. They don't want to bet on people that have sort of gone so far left, are not really sort of solid candidates, and they're just thinking, I got to get an MBA just so I can restart my career. Most top tier business schools are not going to be comfortable with that. So if you are that person, you've got to come at it a different way. Okay, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't go to business school. I've seen plenty of people that, you know, were in my class at Wharton who were probably not doing that well prior to business school, but they found a way to craft their narrative to make it seem like they probably were doing better than they were. Okay, um, schools do look at higher ability, um, and so if you're an older candidate, you've got to help them sort of understand. You have to help them mitigate that risk. What I mean by that is, if you were sort of 45 years old and you're saying you want to get into um, you know, you want to sort of be a first year associate, do a rotational program at like a Procter and Gamble. You know, you've got to make them feel comfortable that you actually can get that job. So, because typically, those companies that do rotational programs or have anal, you know, associates out of business school, they're typically like, you know, 27, 28 through 30, 31. Um, and so, the schools won't be comfortable. That you're not going to really be able to find a job. You're not going to hit your goals, and you're going to be a disgruntled one. So. If you're in that kind of position, show them that you've done your research. Show them that you know what you're talking about. Show them that maybe you've gone out and spoken to some recruiters. You have contacts in the fields who are saying, look, you know, Stacy, if you go to school and get an MBA, you know, we're going to hire you. Show them this. Okay, it's very important. Too young, right? Get this all the time. Um, most schools now are looking for some younger candidates, and even a school like HBS, they've got a two plus two program where you apply in your senior year, you go work for, you get accepted. You go work for two years and you matriculate in two years. But you've got other top tier schools and other schools now are following suit that accept people straight from undergrad and you can come straight. Now, you've got to be clear about kind of what you're bringing to the table. You've got to be clear about your value to the class. So we've typically seen people, the young people that we've worked with who've gotten into school, a couple, there are a couple of interesting things about them. One. They tend to be very clear about what they want, and they tend to be very good at articulating the fact that their goals might be super, t might be a little bit time sensitive. So you see sometimes some entrepreneurs. You see people sometimes that are good in technology. Um, technology, not totally, but technology often is kind of the purview or d the domain rather of a lot of young people. And so we've had a number of people who started small companies, sometimes unsuccessfully, to be honest with you, in college, but. You know, their technology company is able to say, look, you know, I bring this skill set, I bring this awareness of this industry, and that's something that a lot of schools or business schools are interested in, okay? So you've got to think about the different areas. Obviously, you've got to highlight, if you're applying from college, um, you've got to highlight your experience in college. So your leadership in, in college, your internships in college become much more important than someone who is like five to six years out of school is applying as a professional, a working professional. What I would tell you, though, is there's a difference between getting into school young and it being a great decision for you to go when you're young. So make sure that you're going at the right time for you. Make sure that you're going to be able to harness all the great opportunities that the business school has to offer because you're mature enough to take advantage of you know what you want. Make sure that you feel comfortable dealing with older, older candidates. You know, I have a very, very good friend of mine who did the equivalent of a 2 plus 2 before it existed. And he graduated, when I was at Harvard, he was at MIT, he graduated 21. He worked for um, he worked for a year in change, applied, and then started when he was 23 at our Harvard Business School. And he graduated 25. And he's had a successful career, but he was telling me, he was going back for his 10th year reunion, and he was telling me that like he didn't feel like he knew that many people or really can connect with that many people because he entered school when he was not even 24, and his classmates were 27, you know, 28, and he just didn't feel like he had as much to talk to him about. And they kind of, I think they had a, they called him young something, right? I mean, he kind of was branded as like this kind of young brainiac, and he look, he did well in his career, but he just felt like he didn't get as much out of it. He didn't know what he wanted to do. He didn't feel comfortable approaching and building relationships with his professors, he didn't, much less his classmates, he just didn't, wasn't able to do that in the way that he wanted 
had he gone to school two, three years later, it would have been a different story. So don't be in a rush to get it over with. Go when it makes sense for you, okay? In terms of our advantages, find the programs that are a good fit for your situation. Um, you know, if you are sort of on the outside, make sure you're the best candidate, right? So if you are applying young or old, make sure your scores are great. Make sure you've got great promotions. Like if you're atypical in any way, shape, or form, you need to be some of the best. You need to be amongst the best in your group. And make sure your recommenders are highlighting that as well, okay? Getting back to the research portion, speak to ADCOM, speak to alumni at the school, speak to current students, speak to alumni of your undergraduate programs. You usually can find those online. If you've gone to business school, make sure you're informed that it's a great fit for you and it'll make sense for you. And I will tell you that schools only speak, speak about this, but at every school there are people unhappy that they went to school. Okay, I've got a very good friend of mine uh, went to Wharton with me. He runs a successful company on the West Coast startup. They raised probably about forty to forty-five million dollars in funding. So he's on his way. But I saw him at my reunion, and he felt like you know it, he liked the people at Wharton, but he felt like it was a waste of time because he wanted to be an entrepreneur. It took him a while to sort of dig out of the debt. He came out of school, he had an idea, but it was $130,000, $140,000 in debt, and he just felt like he didn't need it, okay? So make sure it makes sense for you. Let's look at a couple of case studies. I'm not going to answer all these. I want to get to some questions. I'm not going to review all these, rather, but I want to give an idea of sort of some of the atypical people that are out there and what they've had to do. So this is an environmentalist who wanted to get into sustainability management. You know, not a huge sort of transition, okay? So she, I, we try to keep these people generally a little bit vague because they're people we've worked with, and I don't want them coming back after me. But this is a candidate who had pretty good grades, okay? So she went to a school um, in the New York, Pennsylvania, mid-Atlantic area, Maryland area, um, you know, had good grades, good GMAT score, uh, basically had done sort of environmental type work, had three years of experience. Um, her Experience was focused on um, on sort of land, like like her management experience was focused on projects. She didn't really manage people; she managed projects, and she had to leverage resources in her company. People that didn't really report to her to do so. And her functional experience was in sort of strategy operations, project management. By the way, this is how I recommend that you start to think about yourself. Like write this kind of stuff down. Like, what's my functional experience? What's my management experience? Okay. Um, lived in the Mid-Atlantic, was in a bunch of different things, uh, which I thought was, was pretty cool. Um, unique personal experience, and again, think about this in your background. So um, she traveled basically to, to you know, many countries, okay, and had done a lot of research on sort of green living sustainability. And I thought, okay, this is something we can build around, right? Done a lot of work, community service with homeless people, um, and basically, you know, sort of, I uh, done some food assistance environmental training. So she was committed to this industry, right? Challenges. She had no idea what to include in the essays or like which experiences. Um, she's coming from an industry and a company, by the way, that didn't really send people to business school. And so she had no one to talk to about that. She didn't have anyone to really pattern herself after. Um, she didn't really know the best schools for her. Um, didn't have a huge amount of work experience about it. She applied with two years of experience, started with started school with three, okay, and didn't have great management um, opportunities. But, you know, over time, we sort of helped her cultivate a list of the schools, and, you know, we thought that she was a really good candidate for her grades and her GMAT score, and that she had some, some unique experience to bring to the table, so we helped go through these schools, Harvard, because of the brand, because they actually placed a lot of people in this field, and Berkeley and Cornell had really strong sustainability um, and CSR, customer service, um, um, uh, 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 sort of focuses in their in their businesses, right? They had, there were companies coming to these schools that were hiring people to be involved in those portions of their businesses, and we thought, okay, this will be a good fit for her. Okay, short-term goal is that you got to get into something that moves you away from is a transition into business. So we said, let's think about sort of management consulting. Long-term goal, she realized she wanted to lead in a global NGO, right? So we worked in to help develop this set of stories. Um, that showcase leadership and, 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 and um, various characteristics. Um, we wanted to make her an expert on sustainability, okay? 
and especially for Cornell, which is one of the target schools. We thought, okay, she doesn't have great management experience, she doesn't have great business experience, but man, she knows a lot about sustainability. And we were lucky in the sense that sustainability was becoming increasingly interesting for people uh, to, to sort of get into. People wanted to be sort of res responsible capitalists, right? And so we sort of tried to ride that wave and say, this is going to be someone who can speak, who can talk the talk. She's lived it. She's done it in school, you know, in school and also after school. And um, this will be your sort of resident expert, Cornell and Harvard and, and Berkeley, if you accept this person. Okay. And we basically were very careful about what we told the recommenders to, to mention. So even though she didn't have great management experience, the so one management project she did have, we had our recommenders write about. Okay. We we had them speak about her being, even though she didn't have each of my work experience, being the best person. One of the top, um, uh, I think she was an analyst, or I forget the exact title, but the functional equivalent of the analyst, one of the top analysts in her group. So she didn't have a lot of experience, but man, was it strong. And she ended up getting into a bunch of schools and, and recently finished a Harvard Business School class of, uh, I think, 2012, 2013. Can't remember which one, but all right. So that's one of the can types of candidates we worked with. This is not that interesting. I'm going to skip this one. I'm going to get to this person because we do see a lot of doctors, right? So this is a a doctor that wanted to sort of get into um, get into um, sort of hospital management. Okay, so went to a really good U.S. university, very good um, Ivy League type school, but not quite an Ivy League school. Right? Did not have a stellar GPA. Now, look, I to some extent anything over three point is great. You know, a solid GPA, but for the kinds of schools this person was targeting, at, that wasn't great. And even for medical school, that's not great either, to be honest with you. Okay. Had taken the GMAT or taken the MCAT done well, and I took the, the GRE as well. Okay, during school, it sort of worked about 15 to 20 hours. I had been a singer and basically was a sort of a DJ on a local radio station. It was actually really interesting people. Um, and the other thing I want to highlight about this is again, you look at this yourself and probably say, I'm just a doctor, but like notice how I'm sort of fleshing out these people and bringing in other things in their backgrounds that are interesting and might be relevant for business school. You need to think about yourselves in those contexts, okay? Um, I sort of, you know, had a lot of work experience. So this person was, um, including med school obviously, this person was, I think, 29, 30, uh, when they were sort of applying to school. And, um, but only had been sort of in position, quote unquote, okay? And not done any heavy analytics beyond sort of organic chemistry and a little bit of physics in college, sort of the, the pre-med uh, you know, prerequisites this person had done, but beyond that, hadn't really done any kind of professional analytical work. Um, had managed some interns, um, you know, and some residents, basically a little bit in her in her uh, in her medical career to date. Okay. Oh, worked her way through college. I really like that. So the 15 to 20 hours a week um, for one or two semesters, when she really didn't have a lot of money, ended up being like 30 to 40 hours a week. And this was something we really wanted to sort of know. Basically, her mother passed, and and, and uh, her mother was helping her make a contribution to her college education. When that happened, um, you know, she had to basically work really hard for a semester or so uh, before the financial aid kind of kicked in. Okay, great community service. Um, we knew that basically there were certain schools that'd be strong for her, right? So Wharton, Fuqua, and Vanderbilt had really strong healthcare programs. And we said, okay, these are the schools we think you should target because they're looking for people like you. Your background fits in a certain type of student that they have on campus. Short-term goal, same thing. We're saying, why don't you think about sort of transitioning into uh, business by doing consulting at a you know McKinsey or Bain or BCG, Booz Allen type company, and then your long-term goal. You know, we kind of listened to her talk about kind of the impact she wanted to have and the money she wanted to make and where she wanted to live and the kind of uh, functions that she wanted to do. It's like, a, you really want to run a hospital system, right? Like that's, that will give you the opportunity to sort of check off most of the boxes you want for your professional career and the way you want to live your life, right? Low undergraduate GPA in terms of challenges, you know, as I talked about, didn't have, uh, you know, quantitative, let's say business quantitative classes and the quantitative classes she took were so far ago um, because she graduated a long time ago and in college, a class that she took um, that were really quantitative happened in the front end of her sort of college career. So literally like 12, you know, 10 to 11 years ago, right? Um, no business exposure. 
and not a real good idea for how to get to this place to, to, to run this like hospital system. Just, you know, like she had been so focused on being a good doctor that she hadn't really picked her head up and said, okay, how do I actually run a hospital as opposed to just serving patients? So we were to develop this set of stories and experiences for Business School of Future Career. You need to do that as well. Um, we really make sure, made sure that the essays and the interview and the recommenders, we wanted all of them to have a similar theme of developing business, of highlighting business specific skills. Think about what I talked about at the, at the top of the hour in terms of like someone coming from the military or coming from teaching. There's still skills and experience they have which are relevant for business. Same with this doctor as well. Okay? And then we also um, encouraged um, her to take classes. All right, the best school that she could afford, take classes. She took some classes. We wanted her to take more, actually. She kind of negged us and said, I'm only taking two at finance and accounting. But it did the trick, and she ended up going to Wharton. Um, so we're pretty pleased with that. Okay? So next steps. Let's get to some questions. Okay, we're right on time. Um, if you want to work with us, there are many ways to work with us. Okay, we've got um, hourly. We've got final review packages. We've got full service packages, it's on our website, but basically we want to work with you. If you want to work with us, we want to work with you. So don't let money be an issue. Call us, reach out to us, let's get a free consultation and let's, we'll try to help you figure out how we can do it. We've done spread out payments, we've tried to change our offerings to kind of be, you know, people that want high touch, you can afford it, you got it. People that sort of just need help here and there, we've got something for you too. So please do reach out if it's of interest and we also are running a 10% discount with our, our good friends BTG. You can use discount code 1908 on the website. We've got a ding analysis. You applied last year, did not get in. You're wondering what happened. This is a package for you. And we'll actually give you a credit. Um, anything else that you do with us, of half of it. And if you're not applying this fall, winter, but applying next year, and you're wondering what you should do to make yourself a competitive candidate, we've designed a package for you. We're kind of out of packages. We don't, we don't have anything else we can design. But um, we'll also give you credit on that. Okay. Um, if you don't have if you don't have a GMAT score, you have a poor score. Take it. Uh, we work with Princeton. We like them a lot. I think there are other good companies out there too. But we do a fifteen percent discount with Princeton when you sell. You can go to the website and, and do that. It's uh, you don't have to work with us to take advantage of that discount. Um, we're out on social media trying to do more of that. So if you think of it, it'd be great to have you sort of fan us and friend us. We've got. A couple more webinars that are coming up in the next week or two that are really of interest. So if you're looking at Booth, I'm actually in Chicago right now. Um, you know, come next week. If you are thinking about how you pick your schools and your recommenders, go to the webinar on the uh, 17th. And then we're doing MIT Sloan with Proceeding Week, and then we're talking about weaknesses. If you have poor GPA, poor GMAT, poor work experience, you've been fired, you have been arrested, um, and believe it or not, all those things that. We, have happened to people we work with, for better or for worse. Um, if you have any of those kinds of things, you should come to this webinar, Mitigating Weaknesses. If you want a free consultation, sign up for a free consultation at flexbroker.com slash admitadvantage, reach out to me directly or uh, via email or give us a call, okay? With that, let us get to some questions. We will keep you anonymous. Um, no question is a bad question, so just uh, you know, let it rip and let's go. Okay, so a question. Um, our second MBA is at any disadvantage. How can they articulate their fit better? So, yeah, you know, if you're getting a second MBA, you are at a disadvantage. I mean, most schools, to be honest with you, most schools off the record, they don't really look well on people that already have MBAs because there's so many people applying who don't have MBAs who could really benefit from them, that they don't want to give that spot to someone who already has a degree. The best way for you to sort of articulate that, you need a degree if you already have an MBA, is indicate what kinds of professional opportunities you're not able to pursue, and you want to give concrete evidence that, look, you know, I, I had a foreign MBA, uh, I went out, tried to get a job, you know, in the States or in Europe doing X, I wasn't able to do it. They told me, like, you know, I need an MBA from you know, a different kind of school, a Western school, et cetera, therefore I'm applying your school. But that, I will not lie and tell you that's not an uphill climb. It is an uphill climb. Okay. Um, 
question. How can I go about explaining the appropriate fit and passion for the school if I'm a non-traditional applicant with little business exposure? What would be other key points to target? So I think you can think about um, the industry you want to get into uh, and say, look, you know, you've got this professor that's in this industry. I think you can look at the clubs and organizations. You know, I'm going to stick with my trusty military example. You can say, look, <clears throat> you know, I am interested in coming to school. I'm a military person. I noticed the military club is really strong here. I went to one of their conferences. I was really impressed with the alumni that came back and the, and the programming of the conference itself. That kind of really instilled my passion for the program. Um, I think you can also highlight what you're going to bring to the table and how you're going to impact people, um, your, your classmates. I think there are lots of things you actually can highlight. Um, and I think the things that you highlight about a particular school don't necessarily need to be focused on what you've done historically. It can be very forward-looking in terms of what you want out of the school and where you can make an impact. Right. So these questions are coming in. Okay. I need to open this up. Sorry, it's hard to read this. Um, when do extracurricular activities become too old to have an impact? That's a good question. I probably would say, well, look, there's a, there's a, a to answer your question specifically, I'd probably would say four years. Um, but for most business schools on the non-essay data portion of your application, they ask you to list all of your activities after college, right? So you'll get a chance to list those things. But I probably wouldn't write about something, i.e. make it the focus of one of my essays or a portion of my essay if it were more than three or four years old, unless it was some kind of amazing accomplishment like universally recognized, like if, if you're four years out and you were a Rhodes Scholar, right, that's a really big accomplishment. Um, and there probably were some, there was probably some kind of amazing, unique experience that's probably worth violating that rule for, okay? Um, as an older candidate who's okay with staying in my current industry, how do I address why an MBA and why now question? Well, I think that you basically need to indicate that you're not going to make it to the next round, uh, rung of your organization unless you basically have an MBA, right? So if you're trying to stay in your industry and trying to stay in your company and you're kind of doing well and you're older, you've got to say, I'm not going to get promoted, I'm not going to sort of get the position I want, and or everyone at that position has an MBA, therefore I need to get it. Okay, question. I'm studying for the GMAT and I'll take it in the first week of November. I have to apply to schools in the West Coast, and my application will be in the second window. What are my chances of getting it? That's a very, I mean, I know nothing about you in terms of your GPA, your GMAT. You're asking a question about second round, really. And it, um, second round does not give you any kind of disadvantage over the first round, with the exception of there's a little less free money available. So, you're, so your chances of getting in second round are not diminished over your chance of getting in the first round. Third round is a totally different beast. Third round, your chances are significantly diminished because most of the classes is already sort of built. Okay. Question: Tips on how to mitigate a low GPA? Come to the webinar, September twenty fourth. I mean, look, you got to take classes. You got to take classes. Um, you have to have your recommenders really write about your analytical skills. You need to have good GMAT or GRE. What's your advice for someone from the media business, publishing, and journalism? Um, it's not unique. I think you know the the advice is to indicate, probably indicate your 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 the catalyst for your interest in business. So it probably was something that you covered as a as a as a journalist or reporter. Um, I think to highlight uh, how media, whether it's social media or you know communications, is really important for business for any business to sort of get their message out, and that you're sort of an expert in that field. I think they probably pointed examples of people who have done it successfully. So one guy that you should look up is um, Michael Moritz, um, who was a reporter, I think, for the Financial Times. And he ended up going to Sequoia, which is a venture capital firm. He actually ended up founding Sequoia, one of the co-founders of Sequoia um, on the West Coast. He ran it. Actually, he was a, one of the leaders. I think he was the CEO of Sequoia. He invested in, like, Google, Facebook, uh, uh, Square, he just recently retired, but he was he's a Wharton MBA, and um, he had an amazing business career. So pointing out people like that who've done it, I think will will behoove you. Well, 
question. I'm definitely atypical in that I was a hair stylist for eight years, co-owner of, co of a salon for half that time, and transitioned to accounting after receiving a bachelor's in business management. With a short period in accounting and now management, should I steer clear of business ownership or highlight both? No, I think you need to highlight that, um, that you ran a business. I think that's, that's pretty, and you ran it, it sounds like, for a number of years, about four or five years. So that's a real advantage because most people, so a number of people are going to be your classmates that want to start businesses, but most of them have not actually ever run a business. And a professor will definitely have interest in, in leveraging your background in the classroom to, um, to kind of illustrate the examples that he or she is trying to, trying, to, trying to talk about, trying to teach. So you definitely want to highlight that. Um, you obviously need to have good scores uh, because, you know, your business, and you also when you, when you write about your business, write more so about sort of the operations of your business and less so about sort of obviously the hairstyles, right? More so about marketing against other companies, more so about how you like convince people to get their hair done more often. Um, writing about sort of differentiating your product offering, segmenting your market, maybe charging more for different or less for different kinds of haircuts. I mean, start thinking about that kind of stuff, the business-related aspects of your company and less sort of the fashion aspects. I think that's probably obvious to you, but I just want to highlight that. Okay, question. I have three years of work experience now. I am not able to study for my GMAT due to a very hectic work schedule. Will it be okay for to leave my job prefer for the GMAT with full dedication for two to three months and then join another job until the beginning of business school. Is this break justifiable? You can do it. I don't really recommend it um, unless you absolutely have to do it. I mean, we get this question all the time. People, I, I kind of dislike when people quit their job to prepare for the GMAT, prepare or work on their applications. And I dislike it, not because I don't understand, but because I know that whatever school they're applying to, whatever industry you're in, there are people who are maintaining the work balance between the work schedule and still applying to school. And I just think that that's hard for you to compare against those people. It seems like you can't multitask in a way that those people can. And frankly, business schools, so there'll be some, you know, um, person in the ad com will say, wait a minute, they're coming to business school where they've got to find a job or start a company, be part of like, uh, you know, be part of, you know, many different kinds of clubs and do their academics, if they're not able to sort of multitask when they're not in school, how will that burden for them being in our program? There will be that person at every single school, and so I wouldn't do it unless you have to. If you really feel like you can't get the GMAT score you want, then do it. You don't really have a choice, but I would really, it's, you're not, you're not putting yourself in the best position in doing so. Question, as a graduate from an arts school with a high GPA, how can I articulate that my Grades and achievements stack up with those of a traditional university degree. Well, do well on your GMAT, one. Um, secondly, um, you know, be really good at what you do professionally. So you obviously are not going to have that quantitative background. What you're trying to say is, look, I can do the work academically, and I'm one of the best people in my field um, at my level. So, you know, there really shouldn't be an issue sort of accepting me because I can come here and thrive and I bring something unique to the to the arena, you might talk about, I don't know what you do professionally, but you might indicate if you want an art gallery or involved sort of in art, you might talk about the business of art. Um, you know, I live in New York and there's, you know, I feel like there's every other week there's a story about how some hedge fund titan is buying up artwork and how it's like art and business are kind of like converging. Um, if you are sort of not in that arena, but you're looking at, you know, you're part of an art organization, museum, can speak about sort of business. I mean, business is really into art. They sponsor it. They support art. So I think it's pretty easy to tie that in. And I think just indicating that you can do the work and showing that by, you know, a strong GMAT and or a course or two, I think would, would be a great thing for you. So the question, what's my advice to someone from the nonprofit sector applying to schools with a nonprofit management program? Do they look for anything in particular outside of industry experience? No, I think you're in good shape. I mean, these are tough questions because, you know, everything is very nuanced and specific. But if you work in nonprofit and you're applying to school with a nonprofit management program, my advice to you is to sort of really hammer that you hammer down that you know or hammer message that you know what you want to do. 
and you, you can bring certain things to the table. You're not someone who's transitioning and has got no idea. You've been doing this professionally. You have your own relationships that you're going to leverage, not just for yourself, but for the school. You're going to be able to bring in speakers. You're going to be able to bring in people that serve on panels. You're going to be able to sort of potentially bring in employers. So really make yourself seem like an asset, but then underscore the fact that you know this industry pretty well. Okay. Question, I'm freelance artist. Um, can it be projected as work experience? Is it a disadvantage? Well, it depends on what you're working. So I think it's certainly being an artist, I, I think like anything you're doing to pay your bills should be, you know, should be projected as work experience. There's, there's no question about that. I think there's a difference between working 15 to 20 hours a week and working 40 plus. And so if you're working 40 plus, then there's nothing to really explain. If you're working less than 15, or less than, you know, let's say you're working half time or less than 40, I think you need to find ways to supplement that and do other things, whether it's volunteering, um, you know, some kind of community service, something um, where you can indicate that you're doing something professionally to sort of, you know, take up your time, and build your skill set. Okay, question. Um, I mentioned a couple of times how consulting is a great bridge to move to a business career from an traditional background. My question is this, if all of us not traditional guys say we could make it in business through a gig and consulting, the outcome probably start seeing through it. Well, yeah, I mean, so I just picked a couple of examples and I think consulting is a great way. I think that it depends on what you want to do. I also think getting general management in a specific industry for a specific companies is also a great way. So if you work in Let's say you work in in fashion, and you basically want to start a fashion technology company, right? Um, like Rent the Runway or Guild Group, et cetera, or even Warby Parker. Those either are sort of in the know about that stuff. You know, you could get a gig consultant come out of business school. You also could go work for a startup. You also could go work for an established technology company. And we've got someone on our team actually that's doing this. Go work for like a Google. Go work for Facebook and then launch your own company. So you've got a woman, um, I'm going to plug her a little bit, um, Alex Keenan, who runs Alex, um, I'm sorry, UrbanHikersSF.com. She went to Wharton, uh, went to go work for Google for a couple of years, kind of learned big company experience, learned how to market brand, learn about SEO, then started her own company. She probably could have written about going to a consulting company, but I think there are many different paths. I was just picking that because that tends to be a big one. I don't think you need to worry though. The, the onus of your question though is about worrying about seeming authentic. If consulting works for you and that's something that makes the most sense, write about it. Do not not write about it because you feel like everyone's going to write about doing consulting coming from a nutritional background because one, that's not true and secondly, it doesn't really matter if it's the best fit for you. Okay. The last question. Um, Drum roll, please. Now, the last question. What are my final thoughts, my final recommendations for non traditional applicants? Like the top threes, do's and don'ts. Wow, this is like family feud. Okay. So the top three do's. Um, one, be very clear about sort of be very able to articulate why business school makes sense for you and how it fits into your short and long-term goals and be very much able to articulate your short and long-term goals. Secondly, be very clear about what you're bringing to the table from an academic, professional, and um, extracurricular perspective. And thirdly, be maniacally focused on your, um, your, your, your signs and signals of success. So if you're non-traditional, like I said, business schools want to pursue pursuing high levels of performance. So make sure that your performance is really strong and make sure you've got corroboration from the recommenders that it's really strong. Okay. Those are the three d big do's. Oh, a couple of don'ts. Don't sort of try to fit a square peg into a round hole. So don't don't write about experiences that you don't. Don't sort of fake your experience or make it seem like something you don't have. Don't make it seem like something that it isn't, rather. Okay. So if you are basically someone who's been an artist um, and you've got you know some level of sort of let's say you're running a business, you know if most of what you do is art. And speak about most of what you do being art. Don't write about sort of the running of the business if you have a CEO that does that. Okay, like be authentic in terms of what you're doing. Um, do not apply if you have terrible school. Do not lose sight of 
the need for you to have great scores um, and for the, the higher level of stress on your GPA and GMAT um, if you're coming from an atypical background. That's something you see people sort of say, well, I'm an artist, therefore, you know, I want to get a business school. I never had to study math, so if I have a 640 and a 32, that should be good enough because I'm an artist. No, no, no. It's actually the opposite. You need to basically show that you're taking that seriously, show that you're really into that, um, you're really into sort of doing well academically and that you're very clear about the fact that you need to sort of catch up and push the pace a little bit because you're coming from a typical field. I can't think of a third one. I think those would be the, the two big don'ts. Okay, so with that, let's wrap up. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I think this is being taped and will be published on Beat the Gmap probably in the next um, you know, week or two. So reach out if you want a consultation, and I will see all of you on uh, the Beat the Gmap forums probably today and tomorrow. Okay, have a good weekend.